Tom and I were getting together earlier and trying to talk about, you know, what are the similarities in our talks? And Jacek did uh, share with us that the reason what we were what we had together was that, you know, not only are we East Coast, where we do databases. Um, so that that was, and we don't do Hadoop. So therefore, we go together. And uh, but we do a lot of instrumentation work as well. So we instrument roads and, and vehicles and things like that. A lot of you are familiar with the gambler's ruin problem, which succinctly says, with probability one, eventually bad things are going to happen. With sensor data, with instrumentation, it's still probability one, but more so. So the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute is a small research institute at a small land-grant university in a small state that seems to be important this year. And um, we've got about 300 uh, full-time-ish faculty, staff, and so forth. We are dedicated to research. Our, a couple of our faculty teach here and there, but most of our faculty are uh, full-time research staff, and then uh, my staff of IT folks, and we have other administrative staff as well. So uh, we always have to point out that we are bigger than the Virginia Bioinformatics Institute because they're almost the same size as us. So, and uh, we have a cooler road. So we have the Virginia Smart Road is a uh, about two mile uh, road that goes out into the beautiful wilderness. It is on the long term roadmap for the Virginia Department of Transportation, but they're real happy with the research that's being done there. Originally it was called the Smart Road for the instrumentation that was in it and the research that was being done with it. Roads are 20 year lifetime things though before you go resurface them. Sensors are five year things. So. There's not really sensors in the road so much at this point. We do some roadside equipment. Instead, in fact, we're going to put some more in for the connected vehicle work that we're doing. But the weather systems that we do and the lighting systems are still very much in operation. Most of the work that we do on the smart road at this time, the uh, lighting group is one of our biggest groups because they can reconfigure the lighting systems for m many different lighting scenarios. They can simulate about 95% of the different artificial lighting conditions that you see in roadways in America, for example. But our big data area is not so much what was the original uh, claim to fame sort of of the Institute 12, 15 years ago, as it is more the connected vehicles and the instrumented vehicles and the naturalistic driving studies that we do with them. Now we also have systems groups and pavement people and things like that, we're a large institute, but our biggest area is the naturalistic driving studies. And the naturalistic driving method says, well, you know, simulators are okay, and there are some things you can do in simulators, like put people into crashes that you can't do in the real world. The problem is, how do you know whether people's behavior in a simulator really is what you see? There's some very cool research that shows brain patterns using cell phones. When you're talking on the phone, that your brain pattern is different than when you're not talking on the phone. And therefore, this is a distracting thing. And we should have laws that say you can't talk on the phone. That seems like a good thing, except as it turns out, when you're talking on the phone, you don't seem to drive any different. We didn't know that when we started passing these laws 15 years ago, and there wasn't any texting. Now, texting and dialing, yeah, you don't want to take your eyes off the road and dial the phone, but we didn't know that then. So really, talking on the phone, as it turns out, is not significantly riskier. And you can look at the confidence interval for the risk rule, you know, and it's, it seems like people can adjust when they're talking on the phone. We all sort of have anecdotal evidence that says, when I'm talking on the phone, I'm not paying attention. But yet somehow, when you actually watch what people are doing in vehicles, or at least what they do in instrumented vehicles, we really don't know what they do in uninstrumented vehicles uh, for some reason. Uh, it doesn't seem to affect their likelihood of running into a tree. So that's the naturalistic driving method. And this was pioneered by many different uh, researchers, but especially the ones that we have at Virginia Tech. So when it came time for the federal government to do a large strategic highway research investment program. One of the areas of this program, there's several different research, large research areas. One of those is safety. And the keystone uh, program within the safety program is this large naturalistic driving study where we will have uh, six regional centers across the country. The idea is, well, we've done some small studies, you know, only 100 cars or so. Let's now have you know, 2,000 cars, 3,000 cars on the road. So we have uh, six centers across the United States. They're all connected to Internet 2 or National Land Rail Packet Net so they can send the data back. We haven't really talked about how much data yet. 
Um, but there's an idea of how much data we're talking about. The 100 car study was sort of the, the first large-ish naturalistic driving study. It took place in the Washington, D.C. area, run very differently than what we do with the Sharp 2 project, but these were rental cars that we instrumented and, and let people use for 18 months or so. More often, we say, well, we'll just instrument your car as long as it's reasonably new. And actually, if you're 16 years old, it doesn't have to be that new at all because we really want to get your data. And um, so for about two years, there'll be 2,000 cars, some are one year, some are, year, some are two year participants. That's why the numbers add up that way. Oh, and by the way, that'll be about a petabyte and a half of video data that we're gathering. Or, well, actually 85% of that is video, a petabyte and a half total. Uh, it'll be about 250 terabytes of sensor data. We also fundamentally changed the way we gathered data over this time, so we really didn't know what those ratios were going to be when we had to make the predictions about the uh, amount of data we were going to gather. We knew it was about these numbers, but in fact, when we first went into the uh, project, we took the data from the 100 car study, which was about 94% video, and I said, well, we know we're gathering more sensor data, but then our video is higher resolution, so let's call it 90%. Well, it turns out it's 85. And that means 15% of it is sensor. The problem is the sensor is the expensive stuff to store. So that was a oops. Now, you do sort of build in these margins here and there, but even when you do that, sometimes you find that you have to sort of pause data ingestion. So we we're talking about how you plan, how you build these margins in. In my case, I couldn't go back and get another few million dollars for infrastructure. So I sort of had to set the mark and say, well, I need to make sure that when I ingest data, I can ingest what I think is an entire day's worth of data, a terabyte or two a day, in no more than you know, four to six hours was what I was shooting for. The idea being that, A, things are gonna break. Remember the gambler's ruin problem. And we may have a site down for days. We may have the central site down for a few days or a week from time to time. You hope not, but over two years, these things can happen. And the other was, of course, maybe we're wrong. And when you're wrong, it takes you a while to build the correction, and that's where we are, as it turns out. So we have a lot more uh, database storage now, but uh, we did have to uh, sort of make that up. So over the next couple of months, we'll be able to ingest a few months' worth of database records and get away with it. So yeah, about one to two terabytes a day is what we see coming in from the field. Now, cars can talk using cellular data but they can't send all of their data home. They just you know, say, this is how big my hard drive is, and you know, sensors seem to be working, and camera seems to be working. That's all, they say that a couple times a week, maybe. And if you run into a tree, then we try to have them tell us. And so what we've got over there, that's just a, a toaster is what we call it, oddly enough. And so at each of the six regional centers, they have a couple of those plugged into a staging server that's got you know, eight or 10 terabytes or so, and they just, gather as many hard drives as they could get that day. These are 128 gig uh, SSD uh, hard drives uh, with a, a SATA form factor. And then they just slurp it over the network and it comes home. That holds a couple of months worth of data. So for a car that's gonna be out there for a year, they go out and do maintenance on it a few times a year. Now we will have more studies coming along. So the thing about the Sharp 2 study is, you might think we're well, just gonna have two years of data gathering, and then, oh, by the way, people wanna use those data for the next 20 or 30 years to do research with. And the transportation safety research community has some um, uh, history being able to do this. They have a very large database they've used for years based on uh, police records and health records and so forth. That was sort of the previous big data set that they had 30 years ago and that lasted them 20 to 30 years. So they do these kinds of things. They, they go get a big data set, and then they study it for a long time. But we do see the OEMs coming to us, other Department of Transportation, Australia and China, and other places coming to us and saying, well, can you do a naturalistic study for us? We say, well, well sure, but you know, can we have the data? So, uh, and then you know, eventually, we're all going to use our tracking devices, I mean our phones, um, to, yeah, some of you know especially how good they are at that, and uh, to do these more what we call epic-based studies. So you can't have this guy gather you know, 10 megabytes per minute of data and keep it there. Even 40 cents off at Safeway isn't gonna be enough to account for that. 
but for 40 cents off at Safeway, I might let you gather my, you know, hard acceleration or hard deceleration events in order to send it back to my insurance company. In fact, it appears for a couple hundred dollars a year, people are willing to do that. You know, privacy comes at a cost. So, and we know what that cost is. It's what we sell it for. And this is the application that uh, researchers use for sort of visualizing the data. They have actually also uh, face view and so forth, but we break the video apart into different pieces. This one shows the forward view from a video and plotting some of the uh, map data. The real um, you know, nuts and bolts of the sensor data tends to be like you see up at the top, which is, oh, I don't know, it's time series. It says it's acceleration, I think. Data's data, right? So what they have found, though, analyzing data, with the 100 car data, you had six terabytes of data, most of it video. And what they did is they had files of data. You may, you may have heard of people that do analysis this way. I don't know why. But they had these files that had the data in it. And they would write these jobs that would open up each file and do this analysis on the file and get the results back. And it would take a few weeks to get an answer. So they and this was with the 100 car data. So when I came to the institute, they said, well, for example, something that's complex. They have some neural net predicting behavior and it took three weeks to run the algorithm over these quarter million files that they had from the 100 car data. If you wanted to know what was the average speed for each trip of these quarter of a million files, it also took about three weeks because all the time was in the I.O. Now, they hadn't really built the system to be massively parallel for the I.O. system and so forth. So there are things they certainly could have done to make that system work better. But one easy way to try something was, well, if it's going to take three weeks to do anything, why don't we take three weeks to put the data into a database? Monolithic database, not parallel, not nothing. In fact, it was even SQL Server. I know you're not allowed to say that in big data, right? But no, this worked out fine. And um, so then you say, select average of speed group by file ID, and it took an hour to get the answer. That's about a thousand fold increase for those of you playing the home game. So we said, maybe these databases are not a bad idea because we can parallelize either one of these two methods. They're both implemented about as stupidly. So we thought, if we now take these ideas and implement them smart, then maybe they both sort of would improve similarly. So I went with the database approach. And by the way, my researchers didn't want to have to program in Java or C++. They were MATLAB, maybe R, if I talked to them hard enough. And some of them like to use SAS. That doesn't work on our cluster so well, but they use that a lot too. And that's it. Uh, I say, well, can I teach you SQL? Well, I don't know. That sounds like something hard. I've heard that's hard. And so you show them, no, no, it's easy, like this. And they say, okay, I guess I can do that. So that's why we use that. And this tends to be the way that they do things, though. That they... <laughs> but along the way, maybe they find out that something did work pretty well in the database, too. But if anything else, it gives them a very convenient data access layer. And if it does something else along the way for them, that's gravy, really. They want a convenient, performant data access method, and this works for them. One particular problem they have is they used to gather data in everything was 10 hertz. GPS only updates once every second, but thou shalt record data every tenth of a second. So you just print the same number out 10 times. That's what they did. They had a big rectangle. And so one of the smart things they decided to do was have all the data go into a columnar format, like a log file. You've heard about these things. And so whatever the time series data is for that sensor, it just reports. If I'm a 10 hertz sensor, I report every tenth of a second. If I'm a 20 hertz sensor, like a radar, I report that. If I'm GPS and I'm one hertz, my data get updated once every second. But then they all get multiplexed together. And by the way, the clocks aren't necessarily synchronized exactly. So the 20 hertz aren't like, you know, every other one of your 10 hertz, they hit it. No, no, they sort of jumble around. So sometimes the researchers say, well, you know, I want to do an analysis of cross variables. So take this stuff that's columnar and put it back into a rectangle for me. You mean lobotomize your data? Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. So if you do that in database, you've got this massive self-join that puts it all back together again and go back and get the last value and do lots of lags and so forth. As it turns out, you actually can do that faster in MATLAB on the cluster. OK. 
Do it that way then. That's actually not entirely fair if you fill in the data points in between for the data that needed to be spaced out, it takes longer in the database at this time. But if you don't fill it in, then the database performs about the same. So we also have the video data, which was H.264. Somewhere along the way, the hardware guys came to me and said, oh, by the way, we're not gonna containerize it into MP4 stream. I said, okay, fine, that's no problem. They didn't say, oh, by the way, the um, parameters of the codec you're not gonna be able to use those for doing data reduction. So when someone wants to pause and go back by frame, then that isn't gonna work very well with the actual parameters we have in RH-264. So you're gonna have to re-transcode it as well. So containerization is you know, 10 seconds, but re-encoding happens at about half wall clock speed. An hour of video takes about half an hour to re-encode. So I built a compute cluster. And had no idea how much compute cluster I needed, so I'll buy one of those. So there's what the data structure looks like. It's, it's columnar, but the thing is, value. These are sensors, and I don't define what the sensors are in many cases. Some of them I do, you know. The accelerometer, I bought that. Some of them are defined in the data acquisition system, but some of them come off the vehicle. Some of them are integers, some of them are floats, some of them are doubles, some of them are strings. The least interesting stuff is string. I do not want to spend all my time doing string parsing. Thank you very much. I don't care if it's got angle brackets. Okay. And if you've got float data and you're printing it out in text and converting it into floats, you're still doing string parsing. That's how that works. So that's not what I want to do. So I use a system that actually encodes those data like it's typed. And that's actually a pretty big reason why this is a good way of doing it. If I had a system that was typed, then I might use that as well. And I get indexing and partitioning. I really don't care about that referential integrity stuff and all the things that you don't like about databases. I don't care about that either. And you can't do it at this scale. Errors happen too quickly. And then you'd have stuff being kicked out. Load it and go. Clean it up every year maybe. But that's why we do that. And the JDBC, ODBC, if a researcher comes to me and says, I want to use Minitab, I'm like, okay. We'll figure out how to get it to talk with an ODBC string to the database and you can use Minitab if you want to. I don't care. We could and probably will eventually go back to a file-oriented approach. Our videos are still files, our audios are still files. And the jury may be still out on whether the raw binary file that the data acquisition system records it in is a bad way to, to use the data. It's not that bad, it's very efficient. But at the time we made the decision, there are a lot of other reasons why it wasn't the way to do this. But, so Stephen Brobst, I'm gonna steal your line. The open source community we often hear talk about free as in freedom. Free as in speech, free as in beer. There's a third kind, free as in puppy. And you know, oftentimes they grow up and they are your life's companion. And that dog is your best friend. And that is what you want, you look forward to at the end of each week, Saturday being able to take him to the park. And sometimes, he tears up your furniture and bites your shoes and kills the neighbor's cat. And it's kind of hard to know which one of those you got. They don't happen very often, but sometimes you get them and it's kind of hard to know. Of course, that's bad parenting. But now there are some vagaries about the kinds of data that we have. We can also break them into sort of hot data versus cold data. It kind of shouldn't matter, but it's a convenient way of sharding the data, just say, well, I'll just have a small amount of data that are hot, just so it's in a small table to scan, or if I have to scan, make it small. The low frequency is really just a DB2ism. That happened to be in the database I used at the time. Uh, Green Plum will probably be a, a good option. Teradata seems to be a very good option, too. Um, but the um, way that DB2 has a structure for clustering, they called multidimensional indexing, where if you have a tuple, of your key value, kind of like OLAP cubes, 
then it will allocate a relatively large chunk of space for that. So by file ID, by variable ID, if you've got 20 hertz data, you got a lot of it for any particular file, for that particular variable, having a big chunk is good. Some variables happen once or twice per file maybe, especially those string data. And you don't want to use that type of index for those type of data, because then you have this, you know, five megabyte chunk for one string value or one floating point. So putting the low frequency table in a different table, data into a different table is sort of unusual for us. But that's basically what the data structure is. You've got your collected data, which looks simple, again, but the problem is we've got lots of different ones because of different types, and you get some metadata to bring it in, and it just sort of knows what to do. So they all look the same, which is kind of a drag, but they're pretty easy to script. So, you know, there's hot and cold, there's low freak annoyances, um, you know, different d data types, and so over longs versus ints. And by the way, you probably want to make sure that you actually have some double before you actually decide to cast it as a double. Um, yeah, it turns out that just because the spec says you might have some double doesn't mean that the sensor actually can record it as, and you tend to use a lot more space to store a double than you do a single precision. Almost everything we have is recorded in single precision, and we ended up using a lot more space originally, so we had to, and one of the definitions of big data I've heard this week is it means you can't move it. So changing your schema can be painful, and you know, it took weeks to recover from that decision, for example. So metadata, yeah, ER diagrams, who cares, right? This is what the, the data might look like, kinda. They'd have lots of variable IDs in the raw data, but this is just give me all the Excel X, so X Excel, the longitudinal, latitudinal, whatever that one is, um, for a particular file ID, and that's what the numbers are. That's what it looks like. Okay. And you know, with a very simple query, my researchers can say, well, how about the average acceleration by file? Now I can easily find you know, what were the files that people didn't seem to move at all, for example. Or in particular, this could just as easily be adjusted to what's the maximum acceleration. About 90% of those are actually outliers and bad data, but some of those are interesting. They're, you know, someone who's had a hard deceleration event or they fly off the road or whatever. So that's a pretty easy query right there. Some of the things they do though, they put different sensors together, acceleration and speed and brake pedal and lane deviation and so forth. So. We talked about, you know, what they wanna do is MATLAB. If you think that Java sounds like a good scientific computing environment, and you probably think Hadoop is a good scientific computing environment. You probably haven't done a whole lot of scientific computing either. Um, so. It has none of the convenience of R and none of the performance of C, so there you go. Um, that was unfair, I know. And I, I say that because I have Java programmers that work for me that actually do scientific computing with it as well. So once you've compiled, then it actually performs reasonably well, but it's important for me to say rude things. So, and we build this data center using sort of high performance computing things because we're at a university and that's what we're supposed to do. So I say things like HPC, but it's really not. You know, my HPC cluster is 48 nodes. The processing tends to be file-based. It's high throughput stuff. It's embarrassingly parallel. I throw a file at a node, and it takes it a few minutes to run. Well, if it's transcoding video, it takes it a few hours to run. Okay. But this is basically the baby picture, number one. Um, so data comes in from the field. The compute cluster actually does the heavy lifting and moving the data around, too. That's one of the reasons I wanted to do that. I didn't know how much compute I would need to transcode video or to support analysts but I had an idea of how much compute I would need just to move data in from the field, decrypt the data, run some Python jobs to break it apart, do the ETL, and that gives me a steady supply of demand for the compute cluster. Then I just add a bit to that. And this is my second cluster. So this is a little bit more detail. So we had different instructions. I was told I was gonna talk about hardware and software and systems. And Tom was told, no hardware, no software, no systems. So, like I said, baby pictures, right? So parallel file system, 
um, based on IBM's GPFS. You could do Lustre, but I needed Windows support as well. So I, re I have a Windows nodes that re-export those for the work, uh, researchers to use. Video files go there. When you open a file to look at, you get your sensor data from the database, you get your video file from the file system, from, from the NAS, and then you're able to view that particular file. Now, when you're doing data mining, obviously, you don't do that. What do they do instead? They run an algorithm that says, find the potentially interesting things. They call them triggers. Okay, they're not anything like a database trigger. Don't think you know what that is. They made it up. But they call it a trigger, and it makes sense what it is. It's a trigger of some, some event that happened while the person was driving that may be a trigger of what I want to look at. And that's what they look at in terms of trying to find, let's put, a, let's put eyeballs on these events that we're seeing happen and see if it really is something interesting or just sensor anomaly or something else going on. So that's where we tend to see this uh, being used. Okay. And there's the detail uh, driving into how to build the uh, data warehouse. If that looks like it was built by committee or by agglomeration, there's a reason for that. Um, so the stuff at the top was sort of where I started. And we had the SATA sort of in my pocket in case I screwed up. So after I burned through that, then we went and bought the uh, airline SAS shelves. This is way, way, way out of spec of what the you know, MPP database people that want to sell you $5 million worth of database licenses would say. You know, this is, I was already sort of twice beyond what they would have recommended. And now I'm you know, an order of magnitude beyond that. But this is a capacity-driven model. I've got a finite amount of money. And you, know, you, you, you place your bets, you take your chances. It works pretty well. It means that table scans, when these things get this big, when the tables get this big, will take a while. So you split the tables into smaller pieces as you, you know, tactically to make it work. But the data load, people can do queries. If you get a little bit of indexing, it helps. There's eight database partitions that live on this, on the eight cores in the 128 gig of RAM. And each one of those lives within here. You noticed fiber channel, maybe. Fiber channel, bad. I know you all think that. I know you're thinking, ew, fiber channel. I don't like the smell of that. Well, you should. Um, the reason for it is only because I want some kind of a network between the host and the disk because hosts fail, operating systems fail. The disk's probably still going to be there, and that way I can just fail over using the switch network. I don't care about fiber channel in most of the things you think about it but I use it to just fail over. They're essentially direct attached disk. So each one of those has its disk semi-directly attached with this layer of cheap fiber channel switches, the cheapest I could get, which actually isn't that bad. I would have used InfiniBand, but I actually wanted it to work. So you work with the staff you can get, with the talent you can get, and there's some really good people that could have made the InfiniBand work and I would have loved it. I, had, I came in with a bunch of very good Windows support departmental sysadmins. And you know, had to let them know that we're probably going to need to run this on Linux. So that's you know, one of the decisions that we made because of that. So what else can I tell you? <laughs>